There'd be a lot of poop in my hands. <laughs> I've seen a six foot alligator go swinging through the air and slam into a tree. These guys are the scientists of the supernatural, lecturers leaving lessons for inquiring laymen. They are applying the scientific method to a world that baffles science. They are the cryptids of the corn. But who else has big black wings and red eyes? Um, Batman. Oh, Mothman. Oh yeah, Mothman. A great white shark was stolen. Oh, someone stole a shark? I got stuff for you you don't even know about. She's a witch. She turned me into a newt. Who knows? Anything could be possible. Anything could be possible. It's really big. Mm -hmm. Abduction vibes. Holy moly. It sounds like you were abducted. And it just stood up. I mean, it just like kept going and going. And she goes, what the... Hello, hello, and welcome back to Cryptids of the Corn podcast. I am the great and powerful mystery. And I am future clone J, clone from the future. <laughs> and together we're going to bring you tales from the high seas. From the high seas? Do you know what today's episode is? I don't remember I told you or not. You didn't tell me at all. Good, good. But before we get into all of that, let's do our front of house stuff like everybody loves. Oh, yeah. Paranormal Magazine. Paranormality Magazine. We are affiliates. If you use anything on their website, use our code Corn Crew, and we get a kickback of it. Links are below. We use their magazine, and you can also vote for your favorite podcast on their website. We've uh, been number four. I think it's the highest we've been on that. Let's try to get to that number one, number one spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. baby girl, yeah. I am on like three hours of sleep, just so everybody knows. Everybody, That's enough. Everybody seemed to love the tired episodes so far. That Three hours is enough. Once again, go check out our YouTube. Uh, we're recording the documentaries, one of the first documentaries in the series this week as of recording this. We're literally breaking ground on the filming. Yes, yeah, so get ready. Go to subscribe to the YouTube. We got to hit that thousand person mark before we release anything, so let's do it. We're getting closer. I think we're like 275 away. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell somebody random you don't even know. Now, I'm going to tell you to do this, but not do this. So don't do this. But what you could do is grab people's phones, take them, subscribe their YouTube to us, and then hand them their phones back. I wouldn't advise doing that. That's illegal. But it would work. It would. I mean, yeah, I guess you're right. It would work. So hopefully they don't notice what you did. No, no, I mean, you take it out of their hand. like. No, I know, but... And you pat them on the head and be like, I know where you live now. Yeah. It sounds like the cult stuff. Yeah, I mean, a little bit, but it's just... Eh. That is our goal <laughs> at the <laughs> end of this, so... It's all good. It's at the end. To have it's one all big, good, baby girl. One big loving cult. That's what you do, and pat them on top of the head. It's all good, baby girl. Let's see how well that works in, re in real life. Yeah, don't do it. Uh, we have a P.O. box. If you're going to send us stuff, which some of you guys have sent us amazing stuff. Specifically, we're looking for new art for the new studio. Uh, we got some really cool stuff already. We're going to showcase it on a live soon. Oh, okay. Uh, but, yeah, it's great. Um, Our first painting we got from uh, the shout-out, Stephanie. Thank you. Our first painting in our P.O. box. Going to mm -hmm. be up in the studio. And then uh, P.O. box, what's the number? 75. So this is P.O. box 75. Ada, and that is A D A, Ohio, four five eight one zero. It's also in the show notes below. It is, but I like saying it. Merch, uh, check out the shop on the website. We got all kinds of merch. Uh, there's new stuff in there, all like getting ready to be in there as of recording this. It should be in there by the time this is out. Specifically, a couple of new T-shirt designs. I will not tell you what they are yet, in case they're not out yet. But it's. A little series I did called the top or the tropics to the tundra. Mm. So check out the store and yes, get a good look at them. Yes, and remember if you're coming to a sh conference or a show, let us know or a sh conference too. Or a sh conference. Shakira, Shakira. I'm on the night. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, I'm so tired. Uh, yeah, no, come. Uh, let us know you're coming. Uh, and then once again, season four, we're getting we're real close. Season four. Our Wednesday episodes, we're trying to do listener submissions. So if you have an encounter that you'd like to share just through email or whatever, like a written submission, please get that to us. We need a couple more. 
And the email is cryptids of the corn podcast at gmail.com. So please send them in. Send them in. Please send them in. Links below. Uh, email is always the best way to contact us for any reasons, whether you want us to speak at your conference or anything like that. Let us know through the email. Ready for the new reviews? Oh, yeah. From Shane Goodwin. Five days ago. And the first three I got are Instagram, or not Instagram, or Spotify. Okay. Uh, and this is all on, I believe, oh, gosh, I should have put down one episode there on. on, on the, I think this is Oceanic Crocodiles. Uh, probably one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. Love the education from Justin. And, well, you know what it is that the J clones bring to the table. Keep what is up it? The, yeah. Keep up the great work. Please tell me what it is. Uh, Rob says, great show. Even better considering the lack of sleep. Keep up the work. <laughs> uh, Wade Tinian. I think that's how Wade, that's, I think that's how I say your last name. I've seen the name Tinian before, and it looks like that. So that's what I'm going with. So thank you, Wade. I just discovered these guys, and I've been loving it. I work long days and have been uh, binging previous episodes. Definitely plan on joining their Patreon soon. Oh, thank you, Wade. Well, thank you, Wade. Now I have uh, I have four for the Apple Podcast reviews. Uh, Chuckles Big Belt Buckles. Oh, I love it. What a great name. Chuckles Big Belt Buckles. And the title is Cryptids of the Corn. I really love the podcast. These guys are so much fun. It's like exploring. I love that they explore different topics and avenues of inquiry. Always looking forward to hearing the new episodes. Keep up the great work. Take care. Thank you, Chuckles. Thank you, Chuckles. Big belt buckles. Uh, Dirty South 93. Just what I was looking for is the title. I drive for a living and have been, uh, this has been my most played podcast for months now. Love the content and love the host. Every episode is a good time with a lighthearted yet serious approach to the topic they cover. I look forward to every new episode. Oh, well, what a fitting review. I really appreciate that. Uh, this next one is Jake D13. I have a pretty good idea. I know who this is. Okay. Jake D. Do we know a Jake D? We do. Yeah, I think this is him. But not. I don't know that for a fact. And the title is one of the best podcasts out there. Chris at the Corn quickly became one of my favorite podcasts. Justin and Jay are hilarious and entertaining. They bring a relaxed and fun approach to every episode. I'm always looking forward to listening to their episodes. Thank you, Jake. Okay, now this last one. The name is hard. You want me to try it, or are you just going to go for it? Uh, so how do you pronounce X with three I's behind it? And then I can get the rest. I mean, that's either 13, or it's like... She like in like Chinese like I think so it's either Shia Matra okay which does sound right then okay or thirteen Matra which also sounds right yeah so one of those whoever you are please let me know how to say your this name or your real name or whatever you want me to say because there's a there's an X and three eyes okay uh okay and it says terrific podcast and then this is one of my or this is one of my most favorite podcasts. I'm a painter, and I listen, and I love the podcast while I work. This one is the best. It combines great storytelling, science, uh, mystery, and then she put in quotation marks, Mr. E. E, yes. A little cryptid history and humor. This is one you can listen to all day, every day, and not get tired of it. All right. I'm, al- I'm always learning something new. Highly recommend this crew to adding to your daily play. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I can't, Yeah, even though we can't say your name for sure, but thank you. And then Jay's going to introduce our new Patreon members. Oh, so here are first off the list is our good friend, Jake Dressel. That's how you say his last name? Dressel? Dressel? I always say it Driscoll, but... It's not Driscoll. I know it's not Driscoll, but yeah, it's, it's at this point I have to call him Driscoll. Okay, fair enough. No. But thank you, Jake. You can always find Jake at a conference if you look for the best hat in the room. That is true. Ooh, be, unless Sherwin's there. Unless Sherwin's there, or I'm there. They might have to, mushroom. They might have to, we might have to do a fight to the death. Okay, um, next, Carrie Quite Contrary. So you've heard her name several times before. Carrie is super nice. She had problems with Patreon, and at one point she was subscribed to us like six times. <laughs> like in like uh, at the one time. So she's back. She's back. She deleted all of her old accounts and got a new one. Okay, good. Um, next is William Button. Button. I like that name, William Button, or Bill Button for short, perhaps. Bill Button. Thank you, William. Belly Welcome button. to the Patreon Corn Cult. Um, next is Manish Nair. Thank you, Manish. Welcome to the Corn Cult. May may the 
Cobbs bless you. Um, next would be Sam Howard. Thank you, Sam. Welcome to the team. Welcome to our Patreon. We're getting a lot of out of country Patreon members too, which is awesome. Yeah. It only the only rough part is the time, like the time just like the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Just trying to plan stuff and communicate. Yeah. All right, Jay. What are we going to talk about today? Well, you already mentioned it earlier. Terror on the high seas, I believe. Yeah, but what what terror? Big, to be fair, like the last three weeks have been water monsters, and yeah. I didn't mean to do it. It's just how it fell. Is it because it's finally raining here? Yes. It's like in your subconscious. <laughs> water. We we do need water. It's been so dry here, but it, it was like water. That was your uh, tomato plants. Mm -hmm. But now look at them. They're taller than me. Oh, well, the tomato plants are in the greenhouse. They don't. They get water every day. It ruined the joke. No, it's the it was the potatoes that needed the water. Oh, yeah. Now okay. they're like they're, the uh, potatoes. Isn't that are, what I said? Tomato potato. The tomato or the potatoes are actively trying to kill my watermelons now, <laughs> not the other way around. Well, because they got water and they're like literally trying to smother my watermelons. They're they're those t tubers are taken there. Tuber catastrophe. Yeah, that I had to make know. up a new word. The Gloucestershire Harbor Sea Serpent. Okay, okay. <laughs> I didn't realize we just jumped right into it. Uh, okay. Gloucester. I don't know how to like. I've heard it pronounced a couple different ways. And I was looking into it. Okay. And some of this research was done by Intern Ryan. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Welcome, Intern Ryan. So showing off, flexing his work. Gloucester. 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 G L O U C E S T E R. Yeah, Gloucester. Gloucester. It's one of those East Coast wor words that nobody knows how to pronounce besides, like, the East Coasters, and they act like we're all stupid because we can't pronounce them. That's like anyone outside of Ohio trying to name some of these Ohio towns. Yeah. Lafayette. Cuyahoga. No one ever says that right. And what do they always say? Like, I don't know. The, the Tuscaroras, everybody mispronounces. Yeah. And it's like, it, there was one guy trying to tell me, like, we're going to the Tuscaroras River for, like, work. Yeah. And I cannot remember the word he said. Yeah. I'm like, that's not a river in Ohio. <laughs> yeah. Believe me. I don't I know. know them all, but I would know that one. Yeah, exactly. But this is the Glo I'm just gonna say Gloucester. 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 I'll pronounce yeah. it wrong or different every time, just so everybody knows. It sounds German. Harbor Sea Serpent. Harbor Sea. Okay, so where's this at? Gloucester. I just. It's in Gloucester. Oh, so oh, it's in Gloucester. It's the Harbor Sea Serpent. Yes. Gotcha. Namix. I thought the name of the creature was the. No. Gotcha. Okay. So where is that? Where's... It's in New England. New England. Okay. Uh, so we're going to talk about the old accounts, and then there's plenty of sightings of this thing. We'll just kind of go through it. There's even a couple of interviews that people did during the time, okay, which is kind of cool. And then we'll even get into some modern-day sightings and some really cool science. Oh, I love the science. Do you? I do. Renowned I traveler John Jocelyn mentioned the Gloucester Harbor Sea Serpent in his writings. Locals told uh, Jocelyn of a large serpent they spotted laying out on the rocks. So there's like a, uh, from my understanding in my research, there's like a peninsula of rocks, like a harbor breaker. Uh, so what people would do is literally like make a wall of rocks at the mouth of some of these harbors mm. to keep big swells from coming in and stuff like that, or at right, least knock yeah. them down a little bit. It's like so the harbors, Yes, yes. Like having those in front, yeah. So the harbors aren't getting beat to death by like medium storms, you know, big storms, there's nothing you're really, right. you're going to do. Can't stop that. But so there's these like peninsula rocks, and he's t they're telling Joseph uh, Joseline that there's been this giant sea serpent that lays out there on the, on top of the rocks basking. So, so they told Joseline. Mm -hmm. What was Joseline supposed to do? Stop it? Well, he was just like he was interviewing locals, like he was a traveler explorer. Oh, okay. So he's just talking to everybody. I thought there would be like Joseline, Joseline, so Joseline, Joseline. That's different. Don't let that sea serpent eat my man. <laughs> Uh, so why is this sea serpent so special? It became the first documented sea serpent sighting in North America. Oh, okay. So that's why it's... The OG. The OG. The Gloucester. Yeah. This fearsome creature lay coiled and resembled a cable, is how everybody kind of described it. Okay. Those who saw the serpent uh, considered firing upon it with muskets, but they did not, however, fearing their own lives would be in danger should they not shoot to kill the beast in one shot. That makes sense. So basically, and it was like a ton of people seen this, but it was always out there. Justin recorded his encounter in his work published in 1641. The account of two voyages to New England is the name of his pamphlet. 
Mm, okay. From this first account uh, until ni- or until 1871, there were sporadic records of the sea serpents in New England. In the summer of 1817, however, the Gloucester Harbor Sea Serpent would become the world-renowned. The first uh, observed or first observed by multitudes of fishermen, the sightings of the sea serpent would become almost a daily occurrence for locals. So much so that after a short time, nearly everyone in Gloucester had seen the beast uh, covering in the harbor. A myriad of witnesses came forward with their accounts, many doing so on sworn affidavits. Mm. Shortly after the sightings began, the Leon Society of New England opened an investigation into the matter and recorded their testimonies of witnesses and later published their findings. So there's like, we're going to go through eyewitness testimonies from 1817. Okay. This is really cool for like one of these stories. You don't really get this, but like this local like research group, this local, uh, they had priests interview people. They had like all this like actual data was collected about this sea serpent. Uh, so yeah, they recorded their testimonies and witnesses and later published their findings. Francis G. Gray, John Davis, Jacob Bigelow, uh, were the ones that collected evidence of the existence of this sea serpent on behalf of the committee. Uh, Lisa Nash, the uh, Justice of Peace, interviewed a number of witnesses whose statements were remarkably cons- are c- constant. The si- or, so here's kind of what the creature looked like on average. Okay. The creature had black eyes and dark colored skin. Its head was the size of a horse or a large dog. Just the head. Mm. It didn't look like a horse or a large dog. Oh, it was just the size of a horse. Wait, yeah. a horse or a large dog? That's yeah. Quite the size difference. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. Adults and juveniles? Or? Mm. The animal was serpent-like in appearance. The body of the creature was about as thick as a barrel, incredibly, and the sea serpent was reported between 80 to 100 feet in length. Wow. That's pretty big. And like I said, everybody in the town had seen it. It's laying on these rocks pretty regularly in the mornings when the fishermen would go out to start fishing. Mm -hmm. Uh, It really seemed like it was basking. Makes sense. Like a reptile does. Uh, Ooh. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of stuff in this that will not seem fishish, like we talked about with giant eels. Yeah. Like we have before being sea serpents. This one has a little bit of its own differences. But it's not like quite like the water horses or anything like that. The giant right. pinnipeds, like Pinky. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a very unique, more serpentine, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely if it wasn't for the basking constantly, I would call this a giant eel. Okay, but it's more more serpent, less ungulate. Yes. Okay. The Leanne Society of New England went through uh, painstakingly great lengths for their investigation of the sea serpent roaming the harbor. The results of the investigation appeared in a report of the committee of the Leanne Society of New England relative to a large marine animal supposed to be a serpent seen near Cape Ann, Massachusetts in August of 1817. That is the name of the pan- like of the finding report. It's, it's, that whole thing I just read is oh, the name. The whole entire thing. Because uh, they say, did a lot of reports. It was at Cape what? Cape Ann, Massachusetts. Cape Ann. Okay, I don't know where that is for sure. It may not even be a thing anymore. anymore. I know where Cape Cod is in Massachusetts. Uh, but so, yeah, they did this big report for this creature. But like I said, luckily for us, book titles are not nearly as long today. The community <laughs> report is fully to sworn testimonies from eyewitnesses. The community sent uh, uh, for strict rules governing the questions of the witnesses and established a list of 25 participant or, or participant questions to ask each witness. Uh, so basically, this was as good as a monster survey can of get ever. Yeah. Like, ever, even today. Like, the committee was taking it seriously. Uh, they had strict rules. They had strict rules for the interviewees and the strict rules for the interviewers. Mm, okay. To not taint the survey. Yeah. Uh, it was done, as far as we can tell, over 200 years later, very well. One of the most criti- or one of the most cited encounters is a man firing his musket at the creature. The animal survived the gunshot. It submerged after he shot it and reappeared 100 yards away. This is the full account as recorded by the community. So I'm going to read. His name's Matthew uh, Guffery. I'm just going to call him Matthew. Okay. But here's his word-for-word account. I, Matthew, of Gloucestershire in the county of Essex, ship carpenter, disposed and say that on the 14th day of August, A.D. 1817, between the hours of 4 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I saw a strange marine animal resembling a serpent in the harbor in said Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire. Hmm. I was in the boat 
and was within 13 or 30 feet of the creature. His head appeared to be as large as a four gallon keg. So here, once again, this creature's this is me talking now. Okay. A little smaller than the average eyewitness reports, at least from the head. His body was as large as a barrel, and his length to what I saw, I should judge 40 feet at least. At the top of his head was a dark color, and under the part of his head appeared to be lightly white. I did also serve feet of his belly, or several, I also was seen several feet of his belly that I saw. I supposed to believe that the whole of his belly was nearly white. I fired at him when he was the nearest to me. I had a good gun. I took good aim, and I aimed at his head. I think I must have hit him. He turned towards us immediately after I fired. I then thought he was coming for us, but he sank down and went directly under the boat and made his appearance at about 100 yards away after he sank. He did not turn down like a fish, but appeared to settle directly down like that of a rock. So right off the bat, he's saying that he didn't dive like a fish. He didn't take off like that. He just kind of pulled underneath the water Mm -hmm. and started moving straight underneath the water. Not hitting the surface, not going any deeper. But he's just right, right, just beneath the surface. So if you think fish, you know, they'd be diving up and down. Or if you think mammal with the tail propelling it or propelling it. Would probably breach surface. Yeah. So we have a lot of weird witnessed anatomy so far. Uh, I got to find out where I was. Sorry. (laughs) My gun carries a ball of 18 to the pound. And I suppose that there was no person in town more uh, accustomed to shooting than I. I have seen this the same animal at several other times, but never so good a view of him as on this day. His motion was vertical like that of a caterpillar. And then here's the questionnaire form for him. How fast did it move? I should say he moved at a rate of a mile or two or at most three uh, three minutes. So that's like a distance, like a... It's an old ship distance. Oh, it's hard. okay. It's kind of like miles per hour, but not really. It's fast. It's moving pretty quick. Oh, okay. Did he appear smooth or rough? I thought it was smooth, though I did ever enduringly to take aim at him and will not say positively that he was smooth, although it is still my belief. Okay. He's basically saying, not 100%. He looked kind of smooth to me, but I was more aiming at his face than yeah. really studying him. I mean, he didn't say, but he... No one's mentioned fur or nothing, right? Right. Okay. Do, uh, does he turn quick and short, or if so, at what form of path was he making in turning? I he uh, he turns quick and short. The first part of his curve that he was turning, and then the form of that of a stump. But this, or but his head seemed to approach rapidly towards his body. Uh, his head and tail moving in opposite directions, in which his head and tail could propel. And appear almost to touch each other. So basically, he's saying that how does the body move? So his head can turn almost all the way back, all 360 on his body. Okay. So and then, like, think of like a snake or an eel. Yeah. Could pretty much their head could touch almost any part of their body. Right. Yeah. Instead of like a seal or a whale. Right. Can't get all the way back right. there. Yeah. So that's basically he's asking like, where is the turning point of the body? Gotcha. It's the whole body, more like a fish or reptile or something like that, versus being more mammalian. Gotcha. Uh, did he appear more shy after you'd shot at him? <laughs> he did not. He continued playing as before. So basically saying that he stayed on the surface, kept moving after he was shot at. Uh, question. Who was in the boat with you when you fired at the serpent? Uh, my brother Daniel uh, and Augustine M. Wolber. What? No, it's Weber. Oh, okay. I was going to say. No, one's ha- no one has his last name. <laughs> So, yeah, that's kind of this first famous account. Huh, interesting. So, uh, Matthew's tale is among the most interesting of all these eyewitness testimonies. The published exposure of their marks consists in the chapter and described to the sea serpent. Uh, there was uh, descriptions, like published descriptions of the sea serpent. I will try to post them if I remember, but there's that picture for you to look at real quick, Jay. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. It seems to show scales. Most people seem to see scales. I think I know what this thing is. Well, as long as you didn't read ahead, we no, don't have any problems. No, I just looked at the picture. But, I mean, from the very beginning, I already have an idea of what... It, once you said the length, I think I know what this might be. I'm interested. I'm interested. Uh, Sculpedrus Atlanticus. 
the committee. So this is once again to the committee. Uh, they have done their own diligent research and have put uh, some interesting thoughts forward. Okay. So they did their own study or something? Yeah, they did a full, like, even with what they think it was. Okay. The committee not only investigated and recorded eyewitness testimony, but they also reached conclusions regarding the sea serpent. Aha. About four weeks after witness uh, depositions, despos- someone killed a snake on the shore of Cape Ann. However, it was no ordinary snake. The snake in question fit the description of the sea serpent that had been appearing in the harbor, except this one was of a different size. Was it bigger or smaller? Smaller. Okay. It was a lot smaller. This led the uh, so basically this one was only like twenty five feet long. Still pretty big. Yeah, but not when the big one on the rocks was seen was a hundred feet long, eighty yeah. to hundred feet long, a head the size of a, a horse. Yeah. This led the belief that this was an offspring of the major sea serpent that may have been killed. Its remains were taken to the Boston for further ex- uh, examination. Okay. We'll, we'll get back to that. Okay. The Canadian report describes the animal in great length, giving precise measurements and details. So they had this body. I was wrong. It was 40 feet. My bad. Uh, they have the body of this creature. They took anatom- anatomical measurements and everything of it. Wait, wait a minute. Does it, does it, at the end of this article, not to jump ahead, does it... Say where the body ended up. Maybe. Hmm. Maybe. Anyways, the animal in general appearance of a snake, but with some subtle differences. There were protuberances running along its spine of the animal, about 40 in total. Uh, the creature had an undulating body and was brown in color. The internal anatomy of the serpent was unlike any ordinary snake. The creature was extremely flexible, uh, which, differing from known species, the community commented the following. The committee considering the serpent a nondescript and as distant from any genre of serpent in its flexible structure of its spine is deemed to be necessary to constitute a new genus founded in this particular area. This has been adopted as a description as Scolopedris and has been added to local scientific names of of Atlanticus. Mm. So they formally described this creature and gave it a scientific name. Okay. Compared to with the genre of Ligurus and Leprechus, the characteristics will stand through scolopedris or scola on the belly, the scoots, and then on the tail and this flexible spine and the home, Atlanticus. Okay. So that's just describing how they formed the scientific the, name, right. the Latin name. The Latin, yeah, exactly. Uh, they had this body. This community reviewed it, gave it a scientific name, and has an actual physical description. Had, he said. I heard the word had. Wow. I mean, yes. I mean, it's 1817. Let's keep that in mind. I know, but... I want to see where this goes. Incredibly short after the sea serpent sighting in Gloucester Harbor, a new creature unknown to science was possibly discovered. There was this dead, or uh, was this dead snake a juvenile sea serpent? We'll never know. However, the community concluded that this was enough uh, significant evidence between the specimens and the eyewitness reports to justify categorizing the two as the same species. Mm. On the whole, there was two animals agreed in many uh, conspicuous, important, in particular characteristics. And no matter the difference between them, that has yet been clearly pointed out, except for the size. The society will probably ju- uh, f- feel justified in concluding that the individuals are of that of the same species, entitled to the same name, until more closer examination of the great sea serpent shall be disclosed, some differences of structure important enough to constitute a, a scientific dis- uh, description. Hmm. So that's a pretty good community. Oh, yeah. I mean, so they're putting the big one and the little one together right now, and until they have a big one on the slab, they're going to say they're pr- probably the, and the same thing. The little one was 40 feet. That's not little, but it is. But it had these these rised bumps along the back. The protuberances, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting stuff. Now, do you know, there are there snakes out there that already have that? It's interesting stuff. It's so, interesting yes. stuff. Uh, really interesting stuff, man. Yeah, okay. Uh, regardless of the criticism level against the community by disbelievers, the committee would made all this in good faith effort. They studied the phenomena thoroughly. They went through a great length to document their findings and bring forth the most credible testimonies. Whether or not the conclusion they were fa- they marked were flawed or correct, their attempts to solve this mystery were nothing short of commendable. And we learned a lot from their approach. This is probably, even in today, the best research by a committee. non bias They just were like, people are seeing something. We need to know if it's a documented animal. They involved what we would classify as their biologists of the day. Yeah. Uh, they described the creature. Like, that little picture I gave you was the descri- like the the scientific description of that creature. Gotcha. Okay. 
it's very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. Interesting stuff here. Uh, what if I told you that our sightings didn't stop? Okay. I would believe you because that's probably why we're doing this story today. So, quote unquote, modern sightings. We have some that go up to the 70s. Now, is this all in the same area? Yes. And I just looked up where Gloucester is mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. You know what's right behind it on the other side? What? What island is there? Montauk? N close. What? Plum Island. Oh, the same thing. It's right on the other side of Gloucester. Oh, that's probably why they're not there anymore. <laughs> that makes sense. A note where the sea storm occurred in 1930. Various newspaper outlets reported the incident. According to them, June 6th, bum, 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 the article in the Lewistown Evening Journal, a marine newspaper, the captain and crew of the Polaran encountered a sea serpent while fishing for halibut. Each crew member, numbering 23 in all, were able to get a glimpse of the creature. Captain Cecil reported the incident to the Frederick F. Dunmark, the security at the Boston Fish Bureau. Dunmark reported the encounter to the Daily Report. According to the captain, the serpent, which was an estimate 150 feet in length, moved at an incredible speed. It swam faster than his boat was moving. It approached the vessel, swam alongside it for a bit, and as it did, it was clearly visible to the entire crew. The animal had a width of an oil barrel with the dark green or brown skin, almost black in some areas. The serpent had the horse-like head. It was about 25 feet of its body was visible out of the, above or out at the surface of the water. So this one did have a horse-like head. Yeah. Uh, not horse-sized, horse-like. Uh, yeah, horse-like. Okay. But long serpentine swam fast, followed the boat for a bit. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. And then in 1970, the decomposing remains, what was thought to be a basking shark, was discovered at Mary Hill Beach in Sculta, Massachusetts. The, this, revo this revealed talk of the region's rich history of sea serpents. The rotting carcass of the creature was thought to be some resemblance of a prehistoric creature if not a sea serpent. The Reading Eagle in the article reporting the on the carcass mentioned several sea serpent sightings that had occurred in Massachusetts in November 16, 1970 edition. One of the sea serpent encounters occurred in 1937 when the Nuntucket sea serpent made a possible reappearance after being do or dormant for some time. According to eyewitnesses, the creature had red eyes, a barrel-like head, seaweed-crested back, mm. fire-snorting, tail thundering, horn breaking, uh, and about 100 feet long. That's a big serpent. Several boats, including Captain C. Rollins of Mainland, or Main, Mainville, Mainville, <laughs> set out some pursuits of the creature. There were also a couple sea serpent reports mentioned that occurred in 1964. In May, the creature measured about 50 feet in length, got about 50 feet from a fishing vessel. B, uh, Bruce C. Crew, uh, crewman and our Brucey and crewman Bonjour Hugen B J O R E N E B J O R Bjorn Bjorn there Bjorn Bjorn no claimed Bjorn. that an animal had ridges along its back. Perhaps most particular, uh, also noted that the creature had a hole in its head. Okay, keep in mind the one that was shot about a hundred years earlier. In the shot in the head though, but wouldn't that kill it? Depends. I guess where it hit it. I'm just. I'm I just literally seen a manta ray with its face cut off. Yeah. And it's still alive. But a hole in its head. I can't. Why didn't shoot the brain case? I guess you're right. Yeah. Anyways, in July, a man named David made on a fishing charter boat reported seeing a creature about 70 feet in length, uh, and looked like a cross between a camel and a snake. Ooh. Okay. Okay. So, so this is pretty much the Gloucester, the Gloucester Sea Serpent. Yeah. Now, I have my own thoughts, but you've, I'm sure, developed some things. Well, let's talk about this first. These are really, like, most of these, especially the old one, the original 1817 sighting. Yeah. The community did such an amazing job documenting everything. This may be, besides, like, the real famous lake monsters and stuff, like, besides, like, Loch Ness and Champ. This may be the most well-documented sea serpent ever that nobody talks about. I've never heard of it. Now, there's a Gloucester, uh, like like uh, the glob. Uh, now I can't remember the word. Like what Trunko was. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Not. I almost said globule. Globster. Globster. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we there close. was a globster there too. 
that kind of shadows out the research. Again, right around Plum Island. And I think that lobster is whale skin. Oh, is okay. whale blubber. It looks... Shed it, yeah. yeah. it's just like what we talked about in that episode with Michael. That one is, like, to me, it's the one that I don't really... Where the fibers are all shredded out. Yeah. It looks like fur. And, yeah. yeah. It, that one, to me, doesn't really stand out as anything. But it buries the sea serpent. Yeah. Because it's just like when you look up the Gloucester sea monster... That comes up. That comes up. Hmm. Funny how that works. So this sea serpent is probably the most well-documented sea serpent ever. Hmm. From eyewitnesses to community, they, they even went so far to get biologists and stuff to describe a scientific name yeah. after having a corpse of it. Well, I mean, that's kind of a big deal, too, having a physical body. Now, the body. Yeah, there's a couple of different descriptions, it seems like. Well, no, I'm talking about the one that they had. Oh, okay, okay. The specimen they had was around 40 feet in length. Yeah. Went to Boston for further analysis. Okay. And I believe the Smithsonian was not you have to look it up what year look up what year this Smithsonian was founded it's been a while since we've done that okay all i could find that was said to this body is it was given to the museums for further examination and then it disappeared well that's not a uh uncommon an, an uncommon thing in this field so this is amazing like this thing has very unique especially for sea serpent very unique characteristics uh, I fully am a believer that most sea serpents are giant eels. Oh, like, what? The founding date of the Smithsonian. August 10th, 1846. So it was before the Smithsonian. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, 1817. Oh, okay, you're right. So it may have been like the Boston Natural History Society. And I don't think it was a museum at that point. Probably the precursor to... Yeah. Yes. Miss Smith, the Smithsonian. So we have all this stuff. Uh, what do you think about all the original stories? As far as being real or whatnot? Yeah, just what do you think in I mean, it's, they sound genuine. Like, they, they're pretty descriptive, and people went on the record. They have, you know, the, it was investigated. I, it feels like it's not just a made-up story for newspaper ratings, you know? Yeah. Hot off the presses, yeah. Selling those quarter newspapers. Probably a nickel back then, or a penny. Probably a, a hay penny. Uh, yeah, a hay pe- or a wheat penny, even. No, I have no idea. I'm just being dumb. But, yeah, I feel like they're authentic, real stories. Um, but it, it made me, it reminded me of the giant uh, snakes in, like, South America. Like that video, or, you know, we've seen, or video, the picture, the still image. Mm-hmm. That's that's immediately what came to my head. It's something like that. Could you think of some problems with snakes in the ocean in Massachusetts? Well, the cold water. So that's kind of, but that could be why it's basking. But, um Maybe it's just so big it can it's got a different type of anatomy where it can retain heat better. I don't know. So think about like green anacondas. Yeah. Get large and they have to stay in the tropics because they're so large. Mm, to stay warm. Yeah, it's actually a negative impact for uh, most reptiles like that. Crocodiles kind of do it a little differently cuz they kind of shut down. Right. Uh but they're not actively moving like when they're if they're in the jet stream like we think they don't actively move. Like they they're kind of stuck until they hit something warm. Float around, yeah. So for an animal to be this large and be active and be a marine reptile would be very incredible. Hmm. Okay. But anything else? Like, So you're thinking giant snake? Or legless lizard. A legless lizard. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> what? Nothing. Oh. <laughs> so what do you think about the later accounts? Well, the one had said it had almost like seaweed. What did it say? Like so it's, like, it's more like a fin. Is I, They were having trouble like describing it so these nubs these these nodules that run along the back yeah have some like a fleshy membrane it's, i've seen like the videos of the one snakes that look like it has a uh, like moss growing on them but so that's there's probably... that that's actual moss okay like, that's actually like plants growing on their back it's but uh so there's like dragon snakes they actually have these giant nodules okay like actual like uh, they're not ostrums like a rep like a crocodilian but they kind of look like that where they have these giant like raised scales okay uh this is more described as that with like a fin like membrane running down the back. Right, yeah. Uh like which a, is almost like a bow fin. Kind of like that. Yeah. Where you could think of like any kind of fish that would have a fin running along the whole back, but it's not like it's a very tight fin. It's not very large yeah. by any means. Gotcha. Okay. Imagine like one piece of seaweed is kind of stuck to its whole back. It's like if a fin had a buzz cut. There you go. There we go. Okay. So any other thoughts what this could be before I get into my list? No, giant snake was the only thing. I guess I didn't consider the water temperature, though, so that kind of throws that out. 
So it'd have to be some kind of eel or something. So let's, let's do that one first. The eels. Yeah. Uh, I. W- there's a lot of problems with the eel, giant eel theory for this one specifically. The the area is not the problem. There's tons of eels there. Uh, there's eel fishing charter. Like there's this is an eel area. Okay. A lot of creatures. A lot of times this is described as having scales. And eels don't have scales. Eels do don't they? have scales. Mm. Uh, and people are and people are pretty determined that this thing had scales because they had the corpse. They had like they went through it. Right. Yeah. Uh, they said it was very like you said reptile like. Uh, I feel like the amount of people that did research on this body, if it was a giant eel, it would have been listed as a giant eel. Okay. Like these are people that are taking this very seriously and ended up with a body of this of one of these creatures. A fresh body, not a rotting carcass and like we talked about with the, the basking shark and stuff like that. What was it again they said it was? They say did they say it when they gave it? They this? said giant marine snake. Okay. Uh they were very they very like with you, like very on the reptile train. Okay. Uh so and the other thing is there are eels that have the long fin on their back. There's not many of them, but there are a few species. Uh, the head raised out of the body and stuff like that. They don't really raise out of the water. They kind of like just crawl. And then being basking and stuff like that, that is not an eel trait. That is not, as far as we know, but giant eels could have something, some different anatomy. All right, especially like these ones, yeah. And there's always the other sea serpent stuff, like the giant pinnipeds. Okay. Like this just doesn't scream pinniped to me. This screams very serpent. There's stuff like the Belizemosaurs, uh, which are the ancient, the first whales that looked very crocodilian-like. Okay. They looked very reptilian. They were had big meat-eating heads. They had serpentine, giant bodies. Uh, we don't know what their dorsal fin structures were like because those don't preserve. Right. Uh, they did have four limbs. They were very tight. The, the hind legs were very tiny, but they had extremely long flowing tails. Just like whales. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, even like before the tail flukes developed, they had like crocodilian-like tails. Oh, just actually straight up tails. Yeah, and they had okay. a little fluke at the very end. Gotcha. Okay. So it wasn't like they weren't swimming with their tails yet. They were swimming with their flippers. Right. There was the transition. Uh, this one doesn't seem very likely to me either. Yeah. Okay. Because the scale thing. Yeah. I mean, that's a big giveaway. I, I'm not saying that they could have like some marine reptiles have like very like dry, tight skin. Which will like you know like we have the little triangles and stuff in our skin. It could easily be that. It could be something like that to where they're recognizing that as scales okay. instead of just being like skin skin. Like look at elephant seals and stuff like that around their face. They have like the segmented skin. What about um, what about giant sturgeon? Now the crawling on the land would be the big problem with that. It does have the raised scales along the back. Right. Yeah. It does. It's very. They can get very large. Uh, there's just a lot of problems with that theory true and i think they would call it a sturgeon and they probably wouldn't bask on the rocks too that and i uh, let's say there wasn't basking on the rocks let's say it was well, a corpse that washed up on the rocks and everybody's too scared to go near it yeah okay yeah, true but and but the guy witnessed it with its turning its head back onto its mm-hmm. body i don't think sturgeon can yeah do they, they can they, they have a cartilaginic spine oh really so they they're can, very flexible they can't oh okay they just seem like a big stiff fish well it could, you can't bend them exactly I mean, when they're nine to ten foot long or, yeah. you know or bigger there's not a lot you're doing to, to make move them him. move, especially in the water, but uh, yeah, you're not you're not winning. Okay. Any other thoughts? Come on, give me something. I'm trying, but eel, snake, sturgeon's out. Uh, it's legless lizard. I'm assuming's out. Yeah, let's say that's out. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, a sinkhole Sam type thing deal going on here. All right, I'm gonna let you off the hook finally. All right. I think you're right. Sinkhole Sam, giant snake, just a straight up giant snake. But yes. how is this not, I thought you said the water temperature thing. Because I wanted you to think about it. What if I told you that in the Atlantic Ocean, okay, the largest sea snake ever existed? Ooh, okay. So sea snakes, most of them are tropical species. Uh, but most, all living species today are found only, pretty much, there's not any document in the Atlantic. Okay. But there has been some in the Atlantic. So during the last ice age, when we think the Atlantic switched to being a lot colder than the Pacific, okay, it mo- like a lot of the area, like there's kind of this big, like a big like wall of cold water. So a lot of the smaller species went extinct, but there's evidence. Uh, uh, 50 million years ago, the ocean, uh, well, it's in Africa, of a giant, a giant sea snake. I'm gonna try to pronounce its name, Polophius colossus. Okay. Uh, was discovered in 1999. It was determined to be the largest sea snake that ever existed, calling the tan or the, uh, the basically the African Seaway its home. 
Uh, the largest specimen you have of this is 40 feet in length. That matches. But Titanoboa, uh, which is the largest boa ever discovered, which was yeah. a, a partially aquatic, was up to 60 foot in length. And those are big, thick, snakes. like barrel-sized snakes. So, anyways, yeah, it grew. Uh, it isolated from other serpent uh, species and predators. Back in 1999, the International Science began work in the Sahara Desert in northern Africa. Uh, they were looking for evidence of something not seen in arid lands 50 million years ago. It's an ocean. The ancient ocean was home to more fish uh, and personal hunting grounds at the largest sea snake ever, like we said, Colossus. Using fossil analysis, scientists have discovered that the ancient trans Siberian Seaway was home to more gigantic species than they had thought and why the monsters continued to inhabit this strange ancient ocean. Basically, it was like a big all-you-can-eat buffet. Gotcha. So this produced monsters of all kinds of species, not just sea snakes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it grew up to 40 feet length, but some scientists have put them all the way up to 80 foot in length estimates. Okay. So like Within we, that range still. Yeah, but most of these species members would be 30 foot is what we think. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the weirdest 80 foot reptiles in the ocean. That's not unheard of. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that suggests this species could handle much colder waters than other, uh, other marine reptiles of its clade. So if we look at actually like, we used to think like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, which are reptiles. They're more closely related to monitor lizards and snakes okay. than other reptiles. They're not really related to crocodilians. We actually had Arctic plesiosaurs. Okay, so they could do cold water. Uh, the, they preferred Arctic water. Gotcha. They lived at the caps. Okay. Uh, so that we had these, their cousins, these ancient, like where really, the really distant cousins, did evolve to be big and live in the Arctic oceans. How terrifying would that be? Yeah. Not only is that water, if you fall in, you're freezing to death, but there's a gigantic monster roaming under the ice. So yeah, these these guys. Let's say they're forty to fifty foot, and let's say that th this is what people are seeing. Yeah, uh, this sea snake is so. Sea snakes are fun because they were the most some of the most venomous animals on the planet. Right. Yeah. Like about everyone is venomous. Right? Oh, they're, 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 they're all venomous. They they're, all will kill you. Okay. Uh, the reason why is that salt water dilutes venom. Okay. So they have evolved to be. Much, 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 much more venom than their land, or much more potent venom than their land counterparts. Gotcha, makes sense. So that when basically they're still using their venom to kill prey, yeah, and defend themselves, they need more potent venom to actually do that to do the job in the ocean. So when you get when a human gets bit on the when they're like on the shore or something like that, is why humans die. Yeah, is because it's just like it's not diluting anymore. It's just strong, concentrate. So these sea serpents, these sea snakes, have some really weird biological features and really weird behaviors okay they're generally loners they're generally never in high numbers and they're generally pretty shy but every once in a while there's recordings of these guys having kind of a unique curiosity about them so bull sea snakes which are an, like a green color like a, there's kind of like a flat green color from australia okay uh incredibly dangerous incredibly dangerous snakes to be bit by they're generally very shy except when they go breeding it's when the breeding season comes around. Uh, there's a surfer I watched a video of to where he fully did, wasn't being aggressive. He was curious. He swam alongside this, like, paddle border out in the ocean. The snake did? Yeah. Okay. And every once in a while, he'd try to get a little too close, and the guy would take gently take his paddle and just kind of push him away. Yeah. And they just followed him beside him for a long time. And then he pulled away and disappeared. Hmm. They've also been seen basking on the surface and laying on. Uh, basking on the rocks is a little rare for a sea snake because they started to have flattened tails. So they almost have a fin along their back tail. Okay. As far as uh, Colossus here, we don't know. Uh, there's not. It's hard to tell from evidence because those are flesh features, not skeletal features. Right. Those don't preserve too well. Uh, and it may have even had a much more developed fin than its smaller counterparts to help move its massive body. It makes sense. So if we're talking that this is the Colossus sea serpent. It could have had this long ridge along its body to help it propel through the water a little more efficiently and stay upright. So do you know why dolphins have a dorsal fin? I'm guessing for balance. To stay upright. Yeah. So as they start going faster, 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 they'll stay upright better. Right. Uh, as why whales and such have so much smaller dorsal fins because they're not using it as much because their mass is kind of helping them. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but that's why like, fish dorsal fins, it's, it's all about that balance and keep going in a straight direction. So as these guys get bigger and bigger and bigger, they may need this to help to keep upright. 
as they become more oceanic, deeper water and stuff like that. Most sea serpents are coastal. Most sea serpents are uh, reef reef creatures. We're shallow waters, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. But if we look at the Gloucester sea serpent, it was very curious in a couple aspects. It never, it was shy. It didn't go most time looking for trouble. Right. It did bask. Uh, but there's that one account of, I believe it was the 37, where it swam beside the fishing boat for a little bit and then right. pulled off. Right, exactly. Yeah. We've talked about on Patreon episodes of sea serpents doing that, where they kind of come in and they look, and they're like, ah, oh, and then they pull off. And they're gone, just gone. So what do you think about this? I mean, it's, it fits a lot of descriptions. I wonder, too, if when they were building that wall out, you know, that breaker, mm-hmm. if they maybe it disturbed its home, you know, where... Where it took place, and maybe it was just like, all right, what do I do so now? Those breakers often act like artificial reefs. Ah, or just became a home for it. It became a home. So yeah. a lot of these, sea, like I said, most sea snakes in the world live around reefs. Yeah. They're reef specialists. They use their heads to get into nook and crannies, pull out fish and stuff like that. Yeah. This may have been a perfect storm for this a nice habitat that's why there were several individuals seen there was the big guy that was seen basking yeah you know he's large enough to he really didn't care uh about being seen and then there was a couple of smaller individuals hmm. this may have been just a good feeding spot before the species was in trouble and i do i do think this species in general is not common sea serpents right. or sea snakes are like that in general they're just not ever especially, common especially nowadays yeah i think they were a little bit more common you know back before we killed everything that came around Human beings. Well, like we've talked about, reefs are in trouble. Yeah. And if reefs are in trouble, their larger predators are often the first things to go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so these guys may just be like, we talked about, most people don't understand, that out in the ocean there are giant seagrass beds in the, like sea reefs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Out in the middle of the ocean that we have a very little understanding of. Yeah. Because they're extremely hard to study. They're extremely hard to get there. Uh, they just, I think it was a hammerhead, or is it a sea turtle? I can't remember. They put cameras on one of those. And they just discovered like 40 million acres of a seabed meadows that they didn't know existed. That's awesome. Off the coast, like way off the coast of Florida. That's so awesome. They thought it was deep ocean and it was like, it was 30 foot deep and sea grass everywhere. That is so cool. It's, I think, like the third largest ocean habitat. Imagine like scuba diving there. I mean, you probably get eaten by something. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of animals, yeah. a lot of animals, big and small there. I'll get, I'll get in one of them tin can tubes and float around the ocean at 30 feet and look at, look in that area. I'll, I'll do that. So what are you thinking? What are you going to put for my sea serpent, my actual giant sea serpent? Well, I have one more thing to add to it. Remember that video I think came out last year of that really big skeleton on the seafloor and they went to touch it and yeah. it dissolved the dust? Yes. Could that perhaps be a skeleton? Let's of, talk about that before we wrap up things. here. So Were you going to bring that up? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. So Jay just brought up in the Mediterranean Ocean Okay. on the mud floor, there was a 108-foot-long skeleton found, which we thought they originally first thought was a whale. Yeah. Uh, blue whales do get that large. Uh, there's some extinct species that did get that large. Uh, but the skeleton was bone. Uh, they estimated it died. I can't remember when the video came out. They, were, they had a couple marine biologists. It was like a NOAA thing. It wasn't NOAA, but it was like a NOAA thing. Yeah. And the vertebrae were massive. The biggest one in the vertebra was a foot and a half across. And they had the two. How they measure that stuff at the bottom of the ocean is they use two lasers. Yeah, they're always a foot apart. Yep. Uh, so that's how they measure sharks. Whether so whether the thing is right up against the camera, they're a foot apart, and whether it's two hundred foot away, Still they're a foot, a foot apart. apart. Yep. So that's how they get these estimates of these sizes of marine animals at the bottom of the ocean. It's it's very accurate. It's more accurate than so why we can use it. Why we don't use this in shallow water is because you can't see the lasers as well. Gotcha. So at the bottom of the ocean, it works really, really good because it's dark. Right, exactly. So the little red dots stick out extremely well. It's easy, yes. So they find this 109-foot skeleton, uh, and they're like, it's a whale. Like, the first pilots think it's a whale. The marine biologists are like, that is not a whale. Yeah, it's not Uh, fit the anatomy. uh, Yeah, so I cannot remember the word of it. I just forgot it. But the fins on our vertebra are the little anchor points. There's, There's none present in the skeleton. Right. And they didn't decompose off. They weren't eaten by bone worms yet. Like, they're just not there. They're not present. It's just like, it's just a round uh, spinal column. Right. Yep. So there's only two groups of animals that have a round spinal column like that it's fish and reptiles. Uh, it's way bigger than any fish has ever been documented. Fish kind of have some problems. Uh, the biggest fish are carlogenic, uh, basking sharks, whale sharks. Uh, Lead sixthies was a bony fish, but it was had a much more catalogenic skeleton. Uh, 
and they topped out at 80 foot. Fish don't have the capabilities to get monstrous like mammals and reptiles. Yeah. Uh, just their anatomy doesn't let them do it. That's why blue whales are probably the biggest animal to ever exist is they have that special combination of anatomy to get that large. But this animal was 108 or 109 foot long. They go up to it, and like Jay said, uh, the, the biologists are all arguing and stuff like that. They're like, we need to take one of these vertebra. As they go to grab it, as they grab it, it disintegrates. In the dust. It, because of the bone worms. Mm. So there are animals down there that specialize in decomposing everything. Right. And what happens is there's ship worms and there's bone worms. So there's worms that specialize in eating wood at the bottom of the ocean. There's worms that specialize in eating bone at the bottom of the ocean. Nature finds a way. So they couldn't harvest them. They took tons and tons of pictures. I'll try to remember to put the link on the Facebook page when this comes up, when this episode comes out, because it's truly amazing. Uh, that is probably a giant marine reptile. Yeah. And at first, uh, they're like, okay, you know, it's a giant marine reptile. We had giant marine reptiles. It's just the biggest one ever. And then they did take some of the, the sediment back. They found it was only like 250 years old. Hmm. Whatever it died had died relatively recently. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, 250 years. It's relatively in recently. In the scheme of things, yeah. So this seems to be proof that in the Mediterranean Ocean, where Polarius, Titan- or Polarius Co- uh, Colossus was from, the old ancient ocean that was in Africa, Yeah. there was a skeleton of a recent animal that died 100, uh, 109 feet long. So are they still around? Yes. Bum, bum, bum. And like you said, at that size, I think they have adapted like something like other marine reptiles have to deal with the cold. Hmm. See, uh, that's frightening. Yeah, that, that's just frightening. I don't think there's anything to worry about them because they're not eating people, as we know. That like, is true. That we know of. Yeah, I mean, anyone that ever met one, they ain't coming back. More people die in Chicago on a Friday night than well, has ever been killed by sea serpents. That's true too. That's true too. If we're if, there's other stuff to be scared of, right? I wouldn't worry about the sea serpents. You know the best way not to get by a sea serpent? Don't go in the ocean? Yeah. Well, yeah, I know that. I mean, but, I mean, ocean's always, you, at least some point in your life, you got to get in the ocean. Mm. You have to. The glasses are, the glasses are a sea serpent. Yeah, the harbor sea serpent. The harbor sea serpent. No, I think it's 100% real. I think, I believe the documentation, I believe all of it. I do think it's one of these giant sea serpents. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm following Like, on. literally the giant sea snakes. Yeah. I think that there are still maybe a small population of them. Uh, so a couple. I did forget one thing. Uh, sea serpents or sea snakes give live birth. Oh, okay. So unlike sea turtles, they don't have to return to land to lay eggs. Right, makes sense. They do go to breeding areas, which this could have been one. And they they all breathe air and everything, right? Yeah. Sea serpents. Yeah, they, but they can hold like their kills. breath an incredibly long time. It's actually never been fully recorded how long some of the bigger species can hold their breath. Interesting. Okay. So like we said, the green anaconda can. Uh, if you look up, if you Google how long can a green anaconda hold its breath, it'll say like 20 to 40 minutes. But they don't, yeah. That's not true. True, yeah. Uh, the guy that runs the reptiles zoo in Michigan recorded his underwater for an hour and 50 minutes. Yeah. And she only came up like playing. She wasn't stressed or nothing like that. Yeah. She just came relaxed. Up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so reptiles can hold their breath for an incredibly long time. Right. So, yeah, if they don't have to come up and give birth. And sea serpents are shy and defensive. So as far as a biologist going in the water and kind of trying to study and time how long they're holding their breath can be very difficult. Right. Because not only are they hard to find. If you disturb them, they're going to They bolt. will bite you and or you that. will die. Or that too, yes. Yeah, screw that. Uh, but most of the time, their, their fangs are really, really tiny. So most of the time, they can't bite through like dive suits and stuff like that. Gotcha. Like, uh, Yeah, but I imagine an 80-foot one probably could. Oh, uh, yeah. I think he's a little different. <laughs> I think you have, I could. think you have other issues yeah. with the 80-foot one of just eating you whole. Exactly. Just I'll just swallow you. I've been the great and powerful Mr. E. And I've been future clone Jay. Remember, check out our Patreon. we got some really cool stuff coming out on that soon. Oh, yeah. Really soon. And then there's probably a special announcement today or tomorrow. Uh, so look for a short little episode around this time. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Crips of the Corn podcast. Please share with a friend you think would like us. It's the best way to help our show grow. Leave a comment, rate us, a five-star review. And remember, there is always extra content on Patreon slash Crips of the Corn dot com. And don't forget, stay magical.